I'm Eva, and I would like to welcome you to The Charm of It, a podcast for homebodies who are interested in knitting, books, or board games. And if you are a new viewer, I'm so glad that you found your way to my little corner of the internet. If you're a returning viewer, well, I'm so grateful that you've stuck around. I know that the past two years, I have not been a very regular podcaster. And welcome to the new format. So before I really get into the podcast itself, I think that it makes sense to take a minute to talk about the new format. I am now recording with a webcam instead of my regular camera, and that should really help ease um, the editing and setup barriers that were part of why I had stopped podcasting. And as you can see, I'm sitting on a couch in the sitting room. I've got my heating pads hooked up to me. So I think that it will be easier to record podcasts with this setup physically. If you're a new viewer, I have chronic illnesses. So I have to, basically, I fit my life around (laughs) what they demand. Uh, And so I've really missed podcasting. I've missed you all. But it took a while for me to figure out how podcasting was going to fit into my life now because I don't knit the way that I used to and I don't have as many spoons. Oh, also for new viewers, uh, I will include a link to Spoon Theory. It's basically a way of talking about uh, energy and capacity to do things for people with chronic illnesses. Um, so like pain tolerance, energy, all those kinds of things. So, uh, they're not literal spoons. (laughs) As I was saying, I, I just, my life is in a different place. And so I need a podcast that works with my current life. So what I am envisioning for this channel now, and this way you can decide whether you want to stick around or not is to do a weekly, possibly more frequently, I'm not sure, a recording during which I can knit and chat with you all and basically invite you to a kind of, like, if I could have you all over for a knitting group, uh, that kind of thing, but also a book club and also a little bit of board games as well. So basically, at least once a week, I want to record a little session where I chat about all three of those things and eventually I'm thinking about making them live so that if you have questions I can go ahead and answer them there and I think I'll probably also play around with doing live sessions to talk about finished objects that I've knit so that then I can really get into the kind of technical nitty-gritty stuff that I used to but we'll see I might just do that on this podcast Let me know if you have any thoughts about that. It would be much easier on my illnesses to just answer questions as they appeared on the screen, like answer them verbally, versus having to type answers, which is very hard on my hands. So that's why I'm thinking that maybe if I can master the live technology, that that might be a way to record these sessions and then uh still keep them up so that basically it's a weekly podcast but it also has a live element for anyone who's interested in that but we'll see i am just really happy to be sitting here and talking with you again because yeah as i said i've missed you all and i am recording uh during the stay at home pandemic situation so in April of 2020. And so it just seems like there are a lot of people who aren't used to having to spend most of their time at home. I have had to do that for years because of my chronic illnesses. And so perhaps restarting the podcast now so that I can keep you company if you want some company, virtually that is. Uh, it just it seemed like the timing was right. So Thank you for listening to five minutes of rambling about the podcast itself, and I'm really happy that you were able to stop by. Moth and Thistle are both on the couch with me. Nessie is napping downstairs. 
Mm, so we'll see if they make any kind of cameos, but for now it's just me and my knitting. So I am currently working on two projects, and this one is a sweater for Joel. Oh, and I just realized I should have brought my knitting basket over because I have a gauge swatch in there, and so you could see what the pattern is going to look like when it has more texture. It's a texture pattern, and once it's blocked, you can really see it. But I will try to spread it out a bit. So as you can see, there's these columns of waves, and they're on a garter stitch background. That's, I think, why it's pulling in. And the pattern is called Little Waves by Gudrun Johnston. I believe it's a Brooklyn Tweed pattern. I am knitting it in the 55 inch size because we measured one of Joel's favorite sweatshirts and that's how much positive ease he likes. Unfortunately, the 55 inch is the largest that this pattern goes up to, which I find very disappointing. It doesn't seem very inclusive to me. I've had this pattern for a few years, but I probably would not buy it nowadays because I just would rather support designers who are designing for all bodies instead of um, leaving out a large segment of the population. So I just want to acknowledge that there, that's a problem with this pattern to begin with because the 55 inch size, I think the suggested positive ease is four inches. So it just doesn't go up high enough. But um, it is a cardigan and it has directions for both men and women. Basically, it's whether you want waist shaping or not, I think, is the main difference. But, uh, and it's got pockets and a shawl collar, which are two things that Joel loves on his sweaters. So when we were talking about what kind of sweater he wanted, because I got him the yarn for Christmas, um... I already had this pattern in my library, and so it just seemed to make sense to go with that design. I have knit this once before, but I ended up doing a different stitch pattern on that sweater for me, and I did a different gauge. So uh, I haven't knit, knit it precisely as written before, and I am really pleasantly surprised. I thought that that texture was going to be a little more complex than it is, and it turns out that even though there aren't a lot of rest rows, it's a 12 row repeat and two of the rows are all knit. Um, and those are both right side. So the wrong side, you do have to, um, like you don't just get to purl back. But it's simpler than I expected it to be, like I said. And uh, it turns out that I can knit on this while I'm reading. So that's really nice. So. I cast it on last week and it's grown very quickly, which makes me happy. So it's a worsted weight sweater and I am using Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Superwash in Cobblestone Heather, which is a really nice dark gray heather. The reason why I went with Superwash yarn, when my own sweaters I prefer to use non-Superwash yarn, especially before I was with Joel. Um, but Joel is allergic to cats and we live with my cat moth so it's very important that he be able to launder his clothes to really get the dander away and to be able to wash them pretty frequently and so superwash just makes more sense for his lifestyle and that's why I've been knitting myself some superwash sweaters as well which we will get to in a minute uh, or at least, and yeah, so because I don't want to poison <laughs> Joel with cat dander and uh, I don't always have the energy to hand wash my sweaters. So that's a thing. I, I have mixed feelings about it, but I can get into that on another session. I think coming back to podcasting at the beginning, I don't need to dive right into controversy. Anyway, so as I was saying, this is a worsted weight yarn. It's 110 yards to 50 grams. And I forgot how quickly worsted weight works up. I tend to knit a lot more fingering and sport weight um, projects. 
And so I am just really pleased with how quickly this has worked up. I'm almost done with the fourth ball, and I think I'll need to use 20 balls for the 55-inch size. When I ordered the yarn for Christmas, we were thinking we were going to knit the 51-inch sweater. So I only ordered 18 balls. But I figure uh, if the shawl collar is probably going to take 100 grams, just on its own at least. And so if I end up having a different dye lot or something, then I can do the shawl collar and the button band in that dye lot. And I think it'll be okay. And if I do have to order more yarn, then I'm also going to order enough to make Nessie a matching sweater, I think, just because it would be really cute. Uh, for her to wear it on locks and have Joel wearing his sweater. The reason why I chose to do Wool of the Andes over one of the Worsted Merinos um, superwashes is that Joel is, he is like a capsule wardrobe person. So he's got a small amount of clothes that he wears very frequently. And because of that, and then because of needing to wash them because of cat dander, uh, I really wanted this sweater to last a while and not pill right away. And so I was just worried that the merino would pill too quickly. He's got a couple store-bought sweaters, and um, at least one of them has really started to pill. So I wanted to, you know, go ahead and make this as durable as possible. I'm sure that I'll knit him sweaters in the future. It makes me really happy that he enjoys wearing cardigans. I don't know if worsted weight is going to end up being his ideal weight. It's definitely a heavier yarn than I would wear for a sweater. But his office in the attic um, isn't connected to our central heating. So it does get quite chilly up there. And he also runs cooler than I do. So this is on the nature of an experiment. And if he ends up wanting lighter sweaters for the future, then I will go ahead and do that. Oh, and then the other reason why I didn't go with Merino is that he always wears his sweaters over long sleeve collared shirts. So um, this doesn't need to be next to the skin soft because it won't be touching his skin. So I thought it made a lot of sense. I am pretty much following the pattern as written, at least so far. I'm looking forward to the cool saddle shoulder construction. But I did change how the pockets are done. Because I remember when I knit this pattern the first time, I was very, it was, it felt very fiddly to have to knit the pocket, like basically you're knitting the front of the pockets, the way the pattern is written. And so what I'm doing this time is instead of putting the pocket stuff down at the bottom and then knitting up, I have put, um, some waste yarn in for an afterthought pocket and I'll knit down so I'll be able to knit the back which is just plain knitting versus having to knit in the pattern and then I'll be able to seam it to the back too so I just think that that will eliminate a bit of worry and Joel requested that the pocket be deep enough for his phone so that's why it's as high up as it is I think we've got the same phone model but um, yeah so I'll probably use a just leftover fingering weight yarn for the pocket lining, um, but that's a, a ways in the future. So I think uh, I'm going to be knitting the body length to 18 inches before, like that, before getting to the underarms. And at that point, I'll probably switch to sleeve knitting. I knit my own sweaters to be like 10 and a half inches, so it's definitely a big change. But since it's worsted weight, it's going much more quickly than I expected. And it's just, it's very enjoyable. I'm having a good time knitting it. Uh, I think I'm going to keep these podcasts on the shorter side. So rather than talk about the other project that I'm currently working on, I'll save that for the next episode. Because as you can see, I'm still going to go into exhaustive detail <laughs> about what I'm working on. I need to tighten that. If I tighten them with a rubber band, then they stay snug, but I never have a rubber band handy when I'm putting my needles together, so every once in a while I have to re-tighten them up. And I'm using my darn pretty wooden interchangeable needles from Diet Craft. I love these so much, uh, but they are in size 4 to 9. 
and I'm a loose knitter and like I said I am usually knitting with finer yarn so I don't get to use them that frequently so that's been another real treat about this project is getting to use my favorite wooden needles um, so yeah and it's just been really fun I have been now that it is getting heavier I am trying to make sure that I'm being as ergonomic as possible and making sure that the weight of it sits in my lap versus being on my wrists. But I don't think it's too bad so far, and I can always slow down if I need to. My elbow was very sore yesterday, so I didn't knit at all yesterday, but luckily it feels better today. I hope that you can't hear the roofers who are redoing my neighbor's roof. If you can, <laughs> then I apologize for that. Hopefully you're not listening with headphones. Let's see. Next I think I'll talk about books, but I'm going to need to take a drink. I am, <coughs> excuse me, I'm drinking homemade iced tea out of a fair trade Ceylon black tea that I really enjoy. Since I have two heating pads on me, and they're both 75 degrees Celsius, 167 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's really nice to have something chilly to drink, even if it's still cool here. We had snow last night. It was really pretty, but it's melted now. Um, so what have I been reading? I've been reading several books. I tend to have a few books on the go. I have a book that I read at night that I know nothing too terrible or stressful is going to happen in so that I don't provoke nightmares. And then I have a book that I read during the day. And then I have at least one audiobook going. So right now I'm actually reading four books. So we'll see how many I actually get to talk about today since, like I said, I'm going to try to keep these episodes a little shorter, more around the 30 minute mark than the 60 minute mark. So first up, I think I will talk about my audiobook, which let me bring up, I can't remember the author's name, and almost all the books that I read are from the library, and most of them are on my Kindle. So A Memory Called Empire by Arkady Martin, and I'm not sure if this is her debut novel or not but it is a science fiction type novel and I'm reading it because it was on the long list for I think the Hugo either the Hugo or the Nebula and also it has a blurb from Anne Leckie on the cover who is one of my favorite sci-fi authors. I was a latecomer to sci reading science fiction. I started reading fantasy novels as a child, and I've always loved fantasy. My mom was also a big fantasy reader. But the sci-fi that I tried, like, in high school and early college, I it was just never my thing. Um, but these days, there are so many women and um, BIPOC authors and LGBTQ authors writing speculative fiction and a lot of them are writing sci-fi instead of fantasy and I find that I really love a lot of that kind of sci-fi so I need to go back and try some of the older science fiction but contemporary science fiction has really become one of my favorite genres which is not something that I ever expected. I think of older science fiction the only author who I've read a lot of is <coughs> excuse me Octavia Butler, who is incredible, and I wish she was still with us and still publishing books. But so, A Memory Called Empire is, it does remind me of Anne Leckie's books, because there's a lot of emphasis on cultural norms and different cultures and language, linguistics type language nerdery, which I love. One of my majors in college was modern languages. and. So that's kind of the feel of the book, but then it's also this kind of mystery story about the main character who, she is from a satellite planet, and she's been sent as an ambassador 
to the primary planet that controls this empire. And she's been sent because her planet's previous ambassador um, is no longer serving. And she doesn't even know what has happened to him at first. So, and then she finds out and she's trying to figure out why. And so there's a lot of kind of diplomatic maneuvering in the book, which I really enjoy. So it feels a little bit like kind of a spy intrigue novel, which is something that I've read a lot of. And then there's also a really interesting aspect about personalities because the culture that she comes from uses memory implants so that uh, you end up merging with a line and your personality merges with the personality of someone who has passed on but before they died they left it as memory implant and it's a really interesting concept and uh, she has an implant herself from the former ambassador of the planet so I would say that those are the primary <laughs> aspects of the book uh, that are really, they're really what drew me in. It did take me a little bit to start to parse the world. You know, there's always going to be a lot of world building information right away. Well, I guess not always, but in this particular book, uh, there is. And so I was a little bit confused for the first hour or so of the audiobook. But now I feel very well grounded in the world and I'm really glad that I stuck with it because I'm very much enjoying myself and I'm very attached to the characters. For me, I think, as much as I enjoy books that are kind of intellectual exercises, the books that I love and the, my favorite authors make me, are always the ones that make me fall in love with the characters. So, yeah, so that's one, that's my audiobook, and I'm very much enjoying that. I would definitely recommend it. I don't think I would recommend it if you're completely new to speculative fiction as your first speculative fiction book, just because, like I said, um, the world building is not as, it doesn't ease you in the way that some books do, like Becky Chambers series, I think, does a really good job of kind of easing you in, and that's one that I would recommend to someone who had never read any speculative fiction before but um, it's a really good book and like I said I'm not sure if it's her debut novel but I would definitely read more by her I think I'm about two-thirds of the way through it so I got distracted by podcasts for a while so I need to get back into it I have also been reading a series by Talia Hibbert and let me bring that up on my Kindle. One minute. So it, I think it's the cinnamon bun. Yeah, cinnamon roll box set. As I said, I usually read books from the library, but this was available. It was three reading novels and one novella for $5. And so I went ahead and bought it because I'd read one of her other books and enjoyed it. And one of my um, most trusted bookish recommendation friends recommended it. And she's the one that posted about the sale. So I'm sorry. Oh, I am definitely out of podcasting practice. I forgot how hard it is on your throat. I need to be speaking more loudly too to project for the microphone. <coughs> so this is a romance series and it's funny kind of like I didn't read sci-fi for a long time. I also didn't read romance. I have actually only started reading romance novels in maybe the last year and a half and it's just not a genre that I grew up reading and so I had some very negative assumptions about it and I think part of that is because it's a genre that's written primarily by women, primarily about women and therefore since we live in a patriarchy uh, there's a lot of kind of disdain for romance novels and I had definitely imbibed that I think but even 
even once I was self-aware enough to hopefully <laughs> look past some of those assumptions, I still wasn't terribly interested in reading romance novels because, of course, a relationship is at the heart of it. And for most of my 20s, yeah, I didn't want to date and I didn't want to have a relationship and I was very happy being single. And so I just felt like if the entire idea of the genre is that someone is happiest in a relationship, then it wasn't a genre for me because I really liked being single, like I said. So I've really only started reading these since getting together with Joel, who I've been with for almost two and a half years now. Uh, and that really changed kind of my outlook on relationships and... It also made it so that when I read romance novels, the other aspect of reading romance novels, if you're single, is at least for me, it just, I don't know. I, I didn't enjoy the happily ever after as much because it felt like, well, I'm not going to have that in real life. So now I'm just kind of sad that I don't have the equivalent of this fictional romance, right? <laughs> so basically, <laughs> those were my very childish reasons for not reading romance for a long time. Uh, but now I have come to really love romance, and almost all of the romance authors that I read are diverse in some way. They come from some kind of marginalized background. So I can't speak a lot to, I think, mainstream romance, like, because I'm pretty sure romance is probably mainly written by white, heterosexual, cisgendered authors, although I don't know. Uh, but what I love about having access to books by diverse authors, let me just check my name, there we go is that because of the tropes of romance, the guarantee of the happy ending and everything, they're very relaxing for me because I know that no matter what stressful things are happening in the storyline, no matter what misunderstandings there are, no matter what trauma the main characters might be dealing with, um, I know that it's going to end well. And... So because of that, they can very much be comfort reading for me while also being diverse and introducing me to uh, different perspectives and just making sure that I'm not only reading about white people, which is important to me. Because, well, we can get into that another day. <laughs> anyway, so that's one of the things that I've come to really love about romance is that also, they, the what, like my favorite authors, they, they write really well, and so it's really easy to read their books. So even if I don't have the spoons for um, a more complex kind of prose, and otherwise I might just turn on Netflix or something, instead I can read one of these books, and I really like having that as an option. It's wonderful to be able to read books. Uh, no matter what my physical health is doing, basically. And that's also why I read almost all my books on an e-reader, because holding books open can make me quite sore. Okay, back to... So, yeah. And then the other reason why I really love romance novels is that so often the characters are dealing with different kinds of emotional struggles or trauma or what have you. And like I said, uh oh, I think I might have been doing this wrong. Uh, like I said, it's a safe space. No, that one's all right. Weird. It's a safe space for watching people work through that because you know that there's a happy ending. So I have found that that is really helpful when I'm working through some of my own past experiences and trauma and that kind of thing. So I just find them 
find them very satisfying on many levels. And I'm so grateful that there are so many incredible romance authors who are doing that kind of work. So, Talia Hibbert is a black British author. And the first book I read by her was Get a Life, Chloe Brown, in which the heroine has fibromyalgia, which is an invisible chronic illness, which is something that I have a lot of experience living, but almost never get to read books about people like that. So um, that was really nice. And then this series is, and it's a contemporary romance set in Britain. And so is this series, which is all set in the same small town outside London called Ravenswood, excuse me. And um, the first book is about a black woman who is autistic and kind of, uh, she had had an abusive relationship and she has gotten out of that. And now she's dealing with the fallout from that because the man she was abused by is very powerful and very popular in that town because he's very good at pretending that he is a nice, well, he's at least, he's good at being popular. And so she's dealing with the fact that he has turned the town against her. And so she's also really into comics and she writes a webcomic and so she's, she still has a life, but she doesn't leave her apartment very much anymore. And then um, a new neighbor moves in next door, and he ends up kind of drawing her out and connecting with her. And then they just have a really nice relationship that blossoms. And so that one is called... I need to check. Ooh. A girl like her and I would definitely recommend it if you're looking for a smart nerdy really warm book I would say that she she's very good at you can tell that she loves her characters and she makes you love them too and root for them and um, yeah so that's the beginning of the series and then the there, one of the other novels is about her sister, and I have just started the third one. But another thing that I'm really enjoying about romance books is that authors tend to create series where each book has a different main character, but the characters are all connected in some way, and I really enjoy that. So this series definitely has that. I'm sorry that my dress is so crooked. Sitting on a couch is not necessarily... <laughs> the best for having your clothes look really polished but um yeah so the one that I'm currently reading is called that kind of guy and uh it's the the first one that I've read by her that has a male main character and he's also demisexual which I actually had to google <coughs> And so it is on the asexual spectrum, and it is it describes people who only have sexual attraction to people that they have a deep emotional connection with. And so the main character in this one, Zach, he has only recently realized that that is um, that is his sexuality, and he's trying to come to terms with that, especially since, of course, he grew up in a patriarchy where men are socialized to connect um, basically to connect their sexuality and their conquests with like how manly they are and so I feel like the way that she's handling all that is very deft and touching and I just really appreciate that all of her novels she she creates characters that I think are have aspects that are very common amongst a lot of us but aren't the kind of thing that you see a lot in more mainstream media or certainly characters who all in some way, some aspect of their identity has been marginalized. And I just, I think that that is such a force for good in the world 
creating, telling the stories of people who traditionally have not been given a lot of voice. And I also find it very healing on a personal level, as I've already said. So I would highly recommend Tahila, or Talia Hibbert if you are looking for just, uh, as I said, really enjoyable, thoughtful stories that are also very easy to read. So a nice Netflix alternative. And if I'm sure I'll be talking more about more of my favorite romance authors in the future. I also, the podcast that I mentioned that had distracted me from my audiobook is one that I heard about from Ash of Sunflower Knits. They had recommended it. I started following them on Instagram, I think through Katie uh, from Imagine Landscapes. And I just want to make sure that I have their, yeah, Sunflower Knit. And they also have kind of discovered the magic of romance as a genre recently. And so they recommended a podcast that I just basically I binge listened to. I enjoyed it so much. And it is it's called Hot and Bothered. And it's about kind of all of the ways that romance novels, both reading them and in the case of this podcast, writing your own. Uh, can help you work through issues and feel better and give you hope about uh, your life and the state of the world, even in times like this. So I really enjoyed the podcast, as I said, if you are looking for some audio things to think about. Okay, so that's a little bit of what I've been reading. And then really quickly, I'll talk about one of the games that we played last week which is Lotus by Renegade Game Studio. We have a lot of their games because we tend to really enjoy them. And this is a game for two to four players. Um, I think I've only played it at the two player count, so I don't know if it would be different, but it is flower themed, which I really enjoy. And it has these really beautiful petal cards. I'm gonna show you some. And, oops, you lay them, oh my goodness, <laughs> there it is. You lay them on the table and uh, you connect, you can overlap them to make flowers. So I'm not going to be able to show you that, but basically, so this particular one takes six petals, but as you can see, like a flower is starting to form. So it's a really pretty game. And it plays quite quickly. Uh, Joel and I, during the weeknights, if we're going to play a game, it needs to be around 30 minutes or so, just because uh, Joel usually doesn't have a lot of brain power left. His work is very exhausting. And also, uh, we're just looking for something to play after dinner to have some interactive time and then go do whatever we both want to do in the evenings. So this is like a good fit for us is kind of lighter 20 to 30 minute games. And what we've been trying out for the past couple weeks based on another Instagram friend that I have, Jen J.H. Trajo, I believe. Anyway, uh, she and her husband will play the same board game every day for a week. And I thought that that would be a really great way to kind of get more comfortable with some of our games and make it so that we don't have to always check the rule book and, so Lotus was the first game, so I think we played four games of it last week. We don't get to play a game every evening. but um, And I really enjoy this one. I will say that it looks like it's going to be a very peaceful, calm game, but as you're making the flowers, you're kind of, you're trying to, so it's like a center garden where you're putting out the flowers, but only one person gets to pick them. And so... You are uh, struggling with your fellow players for control over the flowers. So in that sense, it's definitely one of those direct interaction, a little bit cutthroat games in that the only way for you to get points is to deny your fellow player points. There are other games that are competitive, but where you're each doing your own thing and just trying to do your thing better than the other person. If that makes sense, this is not one of those games. <laughs> This is definitely a direct competition game, but 
And sometimes I find those very stressful. But for some reason, I think it's the theme. It just doesn't really bother me that much if Joel picks the flower before me. I don't know. I find this one to still be enjoyable and relaxing, even though it's a direct competition one. Joel finds it more stressful than me. So that would be my one caveat about depending on what kind of board games you enjoy. This might be a little too direct competition for you. Um, but I really enjoy it. And I've also played it with my sister, and she enjoyed it as well. And like I said, I think that the theme and everyone plays a different kind of insect, and it's just, I don't know. I think also because it's short, so it's not like I've spent 20 minutes building up this giant plan with all these flowers, and then my opponent is going to come in and just destroy all those plants. It doesn't feel like that. It just feels like, oh, okay, they took that flower, but there are always more flowers to put out. And as you're playing the game, you can get different special powers, so you get a little bit stronger, which is something that I enjoy. And yeah, I would recommend it if you're looking for a light, quick game that is really pretty and also very simple as far as um, there's only a couple of actions that you can do on your turn, so you're not making a lot of decisions. And I think it's one that would be really good to play with people who don't have a lot of experience with board games just because um, there's only three things that you can do on a turn. And so there's you're not going to feel overwhelmed trying to decide which makes the most sense. And usually it's pretty obvious. And you've got a hand of cards and you're trying to form sets of different flowers. So it does feel connected to those more traditional games like Rummy or something. So yeah, they enjoyed that as well. And I believe, especially since now I'm not sure if I messed up on the pattern after telling you it was so straightforward and simple. Um, yeah, weird. Somewhere I got separated on it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I believe I will go ahead and stop recording for this afternoon. But thank you so much if you watched this. I am definitely, I think, going to sit down over the week and maybe try to give myself a little more structure as far as what I want to talk about within each of the like knitting books um, and board game segments. But I would love to have your input on that, so let me know if there's things you're more or less interested in. And let me know if you enjoyed this, if you'd be interested in seeing a live version so that I can answer questions. And yeah. Until next week, it was so good to check in with you, and I hope that um, you're all finding moments of peace and calm and happiness despite all of the things going on in the world right now. Clearly, I need to work on my closing, too, but goodbye. See you next week.